So we're broken up, right? I fall silent. I think of the perfect way to respond. But the sounds of all dogs go to heaven too, playing on the motel DVD player for the second or third time this week leave me inarticulate. I guess so, I mutter as I contemplate the tiny jacuzzis of grease and the upturned pepperonis on my slice of Pizza Hut pizza. I turn my attention back to the animated dog ghosts who are searching frantically for a magical horn that will bring them back to life. This is our sixth or seventh night stranded in a best western in the middle of somewhere in the Midwest. Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Ohio, one of those states with an excess of vowels. <laughs> Just a week ago, we were embarking on an exciting cross-country road trip with the promise of adventure and romance. How had we gotten here? How had everything fallen apart? We'd started dating earlier that year. She was in LA on the world's least exotic study abroad program from Massachusetts. I guess her school had a very liberal definition of abroad. <laughs> As the school year was ending, she was offered a prestigious internship at UCSD, extending her West Coast stay by a couple of months. I was heading home to San Diego for the summer, so we made the decision that she'd move into my parents' house with me to complete her dream internship. Now, this would be my first time living with a partner, and in retrospect, sharing my childhood twin bed 20 feet from my parents' and sisters' rooms was probably not the way to do it. The Garfield sheets probably didn't help either. We moved down in early May and within days, her vision of a beach-filled summer of fun evaporates. Why is it so cloudy, she bemoans. May gray, I reply. A month later, why is it still so cloudy? <sighs> June gloom. I get a summer job as a dog walker. I don't even like dogs. I mean, no, he's a good boy. <laughs> While she pursues her passions, I spend my days driving around to rich people's homes to walk their neurotic, temperamental dogs. There's a kind old woman who is too frail to walk her elderly golden retriever. Her house is dark and sad, and I get the sense that my brief few minutes there is the only human interaction she has most days. She offers me food, and out of kindness, I take it. Suspicious plates of leftovers, muffins covered in ants, cheesecake so old it had become blue cheesecake. <laughs> One day after her dog had a hard time getting up the porch steps, she sighs. When he goes, I'm going to go too. He's all I have. My 20-year-old self has no idea how to respond to that. <laughs> well, uh, see you tomorrow, I offer cheerily. One hot summer morning, I go to walk a beefy white English bulldog only to find him dead, sprawled on the kitchen tile. This feels like an omen. Of what? I'm not sure yet. That summer, I'm also diagnosed with depression and anxiety related to seasonal affective disorder, or SAD. My doctor seems almost impressed that someone can get it in the summer. My girlfriend and I fight often about everything. She can't stand my unhappiness, and I selfishly can't stand that she has things actually going for her. After two cloudy months, her internship is wrapping up. We plan a road trip to Massachusetts. We'll drive her car back, then I'll fly home to San Diego. Now, this is exactly what we need to make sure our relationship ends on a high note, a cross-country road trip full of adventure and excitement. We pack up her car and start the trip back to Massachusetts. Though we argue and bicker as we drive, I am awestruck by the beauty of the country. I'd never been further east than Arizona, so the rust-red deserts and vast rolling plains fill me with wonder. Things are looking up. Then about halfway through the trip, an errant crow flies in front of the car and explodes into a cloud of feathers. <laughs> this is the second omen. The next day, a dark, angry thunderstorm becomes a permanent sight in the rearview mirror. After checking into a hotel for the night, it catches up to us, knocking out power to the hotel, pelting the roof and windows with explosive rain and hail. Lightning lights up the night sky as car alarms wail in vain from the parking lot. I have never seen a storm like this. The sheer intensity of the storm has us both giddy. We sit in the dark and watch it like it was a movie. 
We're actually having fun for the first time in months. This storm is healing something. Then I see a bolt strike something on the horizon four times in a row. Crack, 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 crack. Now, I grew up under the assumption that lightning was never supposed to strike the same place twice, so (laughs) something is wrong. Another omen? The next morning as we pull away from the hotel, we see what it struck. A monumental oak tree cleaved in two, still smoldering. That afternoon, the omens are realized. After filling up with gas in one of those truck stop towns, I go to start her car. Nothing. It's dead. (laughs) It's a Saturday, so we get it towed to a nearby motel where we'll have to wait until the local repair shop opens on Monday. A slight hiccup in in our plans, but it'll be okay. The TV in the motel doesn't get many channels, but it does have a DVD player and a small selection of movies you can borrow from the front desk. The only one we can agree on is Weekend at Bernie's 2. We ask the clerk about where to eat, like the world's saddest concierge. (laughs) Turns out the only restaurant in walking distance is a pizza hut. Lucky for us, they're offering a special promotion. Buy a large pizza, get a free DVD of either All Dogs Go to Heaven 2, (laughs) Mr. Mom, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, or Honeymoon in Vegas. We order a pizza, get a movie, and settle in for, hopefully, a day or two. A day or two later, we learn that the repairs will take at least a week or two. My stomach drops. Pizza Hut does not have enough DVDs for us to survive a week or two. We need the open road to keep this relationship alive. We need a goal, a thunderstorm to chase anything but this. There's an outdated dying mall across the parking lot from the motel. We spend the days doing laps in the mall, window shopping at the handful of stores that are still open, eating lunch at Wetzel's Pretzels, Sabaro, or Cinnabon. Then at some point, we return to our hotel, order our large Pizza Hut pizza, and watch our free movie. Continental breakfast, mall. Food court, mall. Pizza Hut, movie. Repeat, repeat, repeat. At one point during our daily mall constitutionals, I decide to buy a watch. I didn't really wear watches, but something about this monotonous existence has inspired me to keep track of the time. Now... If she was disappointed by San Diego's lack of summer sun and my lack of emotional stability, well then this place's lack of, well, everything, (laughs) is the death knell for our relationship. A week in as we watch all dogs go to heaven too for the umpteenth time, we call it. The relationship, like the dogs, is dead. But taking a cue from Bernie himself, we figure we can dress it up in sunglasses and walk it around for as long as we can. Maybe pretending we're happy will trick us into ending the trip on a positive note. It doesn't work, but we keep pretending anyway. We continue our daily pilgrimages to the mall and our nightly pizza and movie dinners. We make a point to get doubles of the DVDs so that we can each have a full set when the road trip ends. I mean, after all, we are being civil about the separation. (laughs) Finally, her car is back in working order and our pepperoni-laced purgatory is over. We're back on the road. It's 16 more hours to her hometown, and we opt to do it in one day, eager for the road trip to end. I check my new watch often. I can't help but feel a kinship with Bill and Ted. This journey is indeed bogus. (laughs) We arrive at her childhood home, a nostalgic hodgepodge of Norman Rockwell small town Americana. Those little half curtains over the kitchen windows, doilies on the furniture, an abundance of decorative roosters. (laughs) She lives on a street without sidewalks, just those shallow drainage ditches where people sit on their porches and call out to their neighbors. Everyone asks her the same thing about her time in California. Where's your tan? To which I explain again and again, May gray, June gloom. Their faces sink. Everyone seems disappointed. I mean, even for those not involved, this summer has not lived up to expectations. (laughs) Nobody knows we're broken up yet, but it feels like they're all eagerly anticipating the inevitable. (laughs) Her parents are terribly sweet. They, They know I'm a theater major, so they surprise me by taking us to see a community theater production of Cats. I do not like Cats. Cats is a musical about a group of jellical cats, whatever that is, all vying to commit ritualistic suicide and in doing, I don't know, become a cat god or something. 
add suicidal cats to the litany of dead animals this summer. <laughs> after the matinee, her older sister comes to visit. We drink Sam Adams, it is Massachusetts after all, which almost washes away the sour taste of cats. We play board games and have a generally enjoyable time. Eventually the sister leaves and my girlfriend goes to bed, but I'm still on West Coast time, so I find myself at the kitchen table with her mom, who brings up the older sister. Last summer, she tried to kill herself, she offers freely. We found her in time, but I don't know. She looks down at her beer. Sometimes I wish she would have actually done it, she says. Maybe to me, maybe to nobody. I get the sense she's never said that aloud before. A stillness falls over the kitchen. Eventually, she asks me what I thought about cats. <laughs> I liked it, I lie. <laughs> so did I, she says. I head to bed. My girlfriend, or ex, it's really hard to know at this point, is half asleep. I'm leaving the next day, so I make a final feeble attempt. Should we uh, have sex? Uh, sure, just don't kiss me. <laughs> we have quiet, utilitarian sex <laughs> in her creaky childhood bed. <laughs> then she turns to me and says, you know, I really wish you weren't here. <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> I fall asleep without telling her what her mom said about her sister. The next morning as she drives me to the airport, my ex-ish girlfriend decides that we should stop at Dunkin' Donuts, how very Massachusetts of her, where she introduces me to the coffee culotta. Oh, yeah. It is, in a word, transcendent. It is what the Greek gods probably drank, just a little bit better. As I sip, it cleanses my soul of the past months of growing discomfort and resentment. For a fleeting moment, I am the jellical cat who transcended this mortal plane. I am the dog who went to heaven. I am Bernie at the head of the conga line. I sip this exquisite ambrosia as we drive in silence to the Boston airport, grateful for this final sweet mercy, her parting gift to me. At the airport, she hugs me goodbye, and we both apologize for the way the relationship had slowly and sadly decomposed. She asks me to call when I land, and I do. I'm back in San Diego, I say. We chat briefly about the turbulence, the discomfort, the middle seat of it all. Are we talking about the flight? It's unclear. I don't think we should talk to each other anymore, she says. Less of a suggestion, more of a mandate. And so, we don't. Years later, I end up in Boston for grad school. Eventually, we stumble across each other on social media. She's a happily married teacher. I'm an academic with a mild to intermediate alcohol problem in lieu of antidepressants or therapy. We agree to meet for a drink, nothing romantic, just to get a little closure after all these years. We order our drinks and start chatting about life, challenges, work. She asks me about my PhD program. It's good, I suggest. I mean, it's really hard, and one of my professors makes me want to just, I thoughtlessly put a finger gun to my head and pull the trigger. She goes white. I instantly know why. It is, and apologies for the metaphor, dead quiet. After an eon of silence, I ask timidly, so your sister, she, um, she nods and stirs her drink. We make some more small talk as we finish our drinks. It's civil, but we both clearly want to escape. I never do tell her what her mom said in the kitchen that night. I wonder if her mom is relieved. The next morning, I stop by Duncan on my way to class and get a coffee culotta for old time's sake. It is still as good as I remember. As I sit in the subway waiting for my train, sipping my culotta, that summer comes flooding back. 
the dead animals, the breakdown, the breakup, cats. <laughs> As my train pulls up, I check my watch, the same watch I bought in the mall in the middle of somewhere. It's dead. I take a sip of my culotta, and I step onto the train. AJ Knox, ladies and gentlemen, AJ.